Hello, I'm Jonathan Engelsma. This is part two in our tutorial on learning Lex and Yak. Today we're going to look at Yak, um, which is also known as Bison. We're going to talk about what exactly Yak is. We're going to talk about how it works. And then we're going to go ahead and look at some sample code and see how we can use it to build a very simple language processor. So in the previous tutorial, we looked at the language processing stack and we, we looked at lexical analysis previously. In this tutorial, we're going to be looking at parsing or syntax analysis. And the way we're using LAC here, YAC here, we're also going to look at the semantic analysis um, and, or code generation. So we're actually not going to generate code. We're going to, do, we're going to interpret our input. So these two blocks are kind of what we're going to be looking at in the sample code um, in our example program in a few minutes. So Yak and Lex are used together. So you'll recall Lex was what we used for semantic analysis. We could define some regular expressions and write some actions associated with those regular expressions. And Lex would take an input source file and break it into a stream of tokens. Yak, which by the way stands for yet another compiler compiler, parses the input based on that stream of tokens that it's receiving from Lex and builds a parse tree and lets us do semantic processing. In other words, lets us execute code which gets at the semantics of whatever the language is that we're trying to implement. Now Bison is simply the GNU parser parser and it happens to be upwardly compatible with Yak, but it does a lot more than that. In this tutorial, we're just going to look at standard Yak grammars. So to get a better idea of how this works, in this figure, you can see at the very top, we've got the expression A equals B plus C times D. And if we feed that through a lexical analyzer that we've generated with Lex, assuming we have the right regular expression patterns, it's going to give us a stream of tokens back that say something like an identifier, then there'll be an equal token, another identifier, followed by a plus token, another identifier, followed by the multiplication, followed by another identifier. It's that stream of tokens and, of course, the values, the, ex the exact values associated with each of those token types that get fed into the syntax analysis stage. And we're going to do syntax analysis using code that is generated by Yak. So the input that we're going to give Yak is a context-free grammar. Our analyzer then, that's generated for us, is going to build this parse tree. And as it builds it, we're going to have an opportunity to hook up some actions that either generate code, like we see in this example, or, as we'll see in the example we're going to demonstrate with, simply interprets the meaning of that expression. To get a little bit closer to the implementation, what we're going to do is write a yak file, and we're usually going to give these a .y extension. So I might have a file called mylang.y that's going to define the grammar of my language, and I'm going to feed that through yak. And if I use the minus d option, yak will generate a header file for me, y.tab.h. Yak will always generate a C file or a C module that contains my parser that recognizes the grammar I gave it. And that's going to be in y.tab.c. Now one of the things I can do in my mylang.y, so in my yak input file, is I can define the tokens, the identity of my tokens, as well as the types of my tokens. And all of that information will get stored in y.tab.h if I generate it. So when I write my lex file, which I place in mylang.l, lex is actually going to, um, or the, the mylang.l is going to include the y.tab.h. And so when lex processes that, that's how it's going to know about the different tokens that the grammar expects. And as we've seen in the previous tutorial, lex generates the finite state machine that recognizes our tokens in a file called lex.yy.c. Now we can take those two C source files and feed them through the GNU compiler 
and produce a executable program called mylang and that is now a language processor that recognizes tokens defined in mylang.l and recognizes sentences or expressions that are defined by the context-free grammar that I've specified in mylang.y. So in other words, I can take source code of my language, run it through this language processor, and produce either the compiled code if I'm doing code generation, or perhaps interpreter output if I'm implementing an interpreter. So what does a YAC file look like? Well, it looks very, very similar to the Lex files that we're already, we've already looked at. The first part of the file um, is separated by the middle part with a percent percent and in the middle part of the file we're going to put our productions or grammar rules and with every production we define we can have an action written in C which can be a single statement sep uh, terminated with a semicolon or if we've got more than one C statement we can put those in a code block and then we have a third part as well that's separated from the middle section with a percent percent as usual. The first part of our YAC file contains the um, C declarations and just like in Lex we're going to enclose these with a percent left curly and terminate this section with a percent right curly and we can put two things in there our C declarations so different things that the actions are going to um, need and we can also put in this first part of the file some special yak definitions and some examples of these would be percent start so one of the rules or one of the productions in the yak file is going to be the root or the first one and we designate that with a percent start and we also can define the different token identities or the token types that are coming back from the lexical analysis we'll use percent token to do that and in yak we could have tokens of different types and so in order to get the lexical analyzer to return tokens of different type we're going to use this percent union definition and finally to represent the types that tokens can be we'll use percent type and we'll tie these all together and actually show you the syntax and how these are used in our code example in a moment the productions themselves in the middle section represent the context-free grammar of our language. The left-hand side of a production, of production um, also known as a non-terminal, is going to be separated by a colon and followed by a right-hand side. If we have multiple right-hand sides following a non-terminal, we can actually um, add those by using the vertical pipe. And then finally, for every production, that we specify, we can have actions associated with it. So here's this very simple example of some productions and associated actions. I have statements, so that's my non-terminal, colon, statement. Okay, statement itself is a non-terminal, it's a production that's defined further down here. And then the action follows that production, so I'm going to simply print out the word statement if I recognize a statement. But I'm not done there. I have another production. So statements also produces, and then you'll see on the third line here, my vertical pipe, statement space statements. And yes, that's a recursive reference to the actual statements non-terminal that we're defining here. If I see that, then I have the action statements. Print, print out the word statements. Then I define the statement non-terminal as an identifier followed by a plus followed by another identifier and if I see something um, with that pattern I'm going to print out the word plus and I have another production statement colon identifier minus identifier and in that case I'm going to print F minus and of course I could have used the vertical pipe there and saved the typing of statement in the last rule Now, when we're writing the actions, the actions in the previous example weren't very useful. They just printed out some silly things, not very useful at all. But YAC actually lets us access the values that are associated with the symbols in our rules. And it does this with the notation $1, $2, 
and so forth up to dollar n, where each of these refers to the token or the non or, or the non the terminal or non-terminal reference on the right hand side of the rule. And we also have dollar dollar, which refers to the value of the left hand or the non-terminal side of the rule. And every one of these symbols has a value associated with it. And that includes both tokens as well as the non-terminal references themselves. And if we don't do anything with these in our actions, the default is that the value on the left is going to be assigned the value of the first token in the production on the right hand side. So here's an example of how I might use these to basically reflect or represent the semantics of a production. So I have my production statement colon identifier plus identifier. And what I mean there is that statement on the left should be assigned the value of the first token added to the third token. So I have dollar dollar equals dollar one plus dollar three. So I can just use these as variables, if you will, in my action, and the rest of the statements basically are valid C code. So we simply use those as substitutes. In, in Yak, when it processes, processes this and generates code, we'll turn these into valid C for us. In the second production here, I have statement, identifier minus identifier. So there, I mark down the semantics as dollar dollar equals the first value, so percent one minus the third, percent three. Now the third part of my YAC input file contains valid C code that supports the language processing. Often we'll find in here a symbol table implementation, something, some type of data structure that we use to keep track of the different identifiers that we encounter in the source code. I also might have the implementation of functions here that are called by actions associated with the productions in the second part. So in the first part I might have the actual um, headers or the references to my um, functions, the prototypes of my functions if you will, and in that third part I might actually put the implementation. So let's go ahead and look at a hands-on demo and see how we can use Yak along with Lex to create a non-trivial language processing system. So I've already written a example program and what we're going to do now is walk through the source code, both the Lex and the Yak source code. Um, but before we look at the source code, let's go ahead and run the program. So my, I've already compiled it and built it, so I want to run it and demonstrate it so you understand what it does and then we'll look at how we implemented it. So this is a very simple um, program that is, I call it calc, and it's a, it's a very primitive calculator, and it's going to interpret different um, arithmetic expressions that I give it. And so the syntax is as follows. Um, I can use variable names, and variable names are going to be one character long, and they can be either a lowercase or an uppercase letter. So I can say something like this. I can say A is equal to um, 1 plus 100 semicolon and that basically has assigned the value of 101 to A and I can confirm that by using the print statement so if I say print A semicolon it prints out the value of A which is 101 and I can use A now that it's bound to a value I can use it in other expressions so I could say B equals A minus 10 semicolon and now if I were to print out B I get 91 just as expected. I can also print out expressions directly so I could say something like this. I could say print A plus B and I get the value 192 and then finally so I can do addition and subtraction and I can print those values out. I can store them in any of my 52 variables and I also have a command called exit. If I type exit semicolon, the interpreter actually exits. So that's the very simple language that I've um, built. And let's start by looking at the yak input. So this is called calc.y. 
And up here in my C declarations, I've got a few things that I'm going to need. So first of all, um, I've got this void yy error. So this is something um, that's defined elsewhere that my parser is going to need to call whenever there's a syntactical error. In other words, something that doesn't uh, suit the grammar. I'm going to use some standard IO. So I've got my standard IO.h. And I also reference some symbols from standard lib.h. So I have that. Now, this next thing here, my array symbols, is actually a really primitive symbol table implementation. So I have up to 52 different variables, lowercase a through z and uppercase a through z. You'll recall a moment ago I said that variable names are restricted to one character each, and they're going to be alphabetical characters, lower or upper. So I'm going to represent these symbols. I'm going to have um, basically a table of 52 different integers, and that's where I'm going to uh, store the respective values. Then I wrote two functions. Um, the first one is called symbol val, and if you give that a character like a lowercase a or an uppercase a, it's going to basically go and look up the value of that variable in the symbol table. I've got a second function called update symbol val, and if you give this one a symbol, so an a or a b or some character, and a value, it will basically make sure that the respective entry in the symbol table for that symbol gets the value that I'm passing it. So the first function reads a value or returns it to me. The second one will update the symbol table with that value. Then I've got some yak definitions. The first thing you'll notice here is percent union. And what percent union um, lets me do in yak is it lets me specify the different types that my lexical analyzer can return. And in this case, the different types that my um, analyzer can return, at least the values I care about, are going to be integers, which I'm going to put in the member num, or characters, which I'm going to put in the element id. And you'll remember um, in C, a union actually lets me treat the same storage area with different types. And ultimately, when we run this through YAC, it's going to represent this with a C union. So if you never thought you'd see the day where you used a union in C, you've just met that day. So the very next rule here is a percent start, and that's going to indicate which of the productions that follow in the middle section is going to be my starting rule or my starting production. Then I've got percent token print and that's just saying I have a token that I'm expecting from my lexical analyzer and I'm going to refer to that token type as print. Similarly I have one called exit command percent token exit underscore command and when we run this through yak it's going to generate a header file that defines um, or passes this information as pound defines in this header. So our lexical analyzer can actually reference these values as we'll see in a moment. Now the third token here is called number, but you'll notice this kind of funky um, num in front of it in, in angle um, a greater than, less than symbols here. And that's basically telling us that this token number will get stored in the member num in the union type. Similarly, I have a token called identifier, and whenever I see an identifier, it's going to get returned by the lexical analysis in the member variable id in my union. These last two statements, these percent types, are basically assigning types to the non-terminals that are going to appear on the left-hand side of my grammar. So a line, an expression, and a term are all going to map to the type num, which we know is an integer, and the type, the type of an assignment is always going to map to an identifier, an ID. So that's the first section. Let's move on and look at the second section of our YAC file. So these are the actual grammars, grammar productions, as well as the associated actions. So my start rule, you'll recall, was a line. And a line maps to 
um, one, two, three, four, five, five different, six different productions here. So a line can be an assignment, and that's a non-terminal that we've defined below. You can actually see that. So assignment is actually an identifier equals expression. So a line could be just a single assignment with a semicolon. And the action here, if I have that, is basically nothing. I'm not going to do anything. Now you'll notice down here that when I receive or when I recognize an assignment, I actually call the function update symbol val and I pass it dollar one, which is the very first token on the right hand side of the production, which is identifier. The second value that I pass is dollar three, which is going to be the value of the expression, which is another nom terminal that's defined below. So what we're going to be doing is assigning to this identifier the value of this expression. That's what this rule does here. On an exit command, I'm simply going to call the C function exit and then pass exit underscore success. And exit is a call in the standard library. That's why I had the pound standard lib up there. And exit success just says everything's working right. You know, the error program is not returning any kind of error indicator. So when I see an exit command, I'm going to simply exit the program. When I see a print followed by an expression, I'm going to print out the value of that expression. And I know it's an integer, so my control string has a percent %d, and then I reference $2, which is the value assigned to this non-terminal. Now I also have some recursive productions here. So a line also maps to line, and then an assignment. Okay, when I see this, once again, I'm going to just have an empty statement because I've already done the assignment down here. I could have a line print expression, and in that case I'm going to print out the third value, which is the expression, and I could have a line exit command. So these three productions here are what let me have more than one statement uh, in a single input file. So those are the one, these recursive rules are the ones that let us repetitively add statements to our program. So as we work our way down the productions, we've already looked at assignment. Let's look at exp or expression. Expression maps to a term, and terms are either going to be numbers, so literal integers, or identifiers, variables, in this case, a single alphabetical character. If I recognize a term, I'm simply going to assign to the left-hand side, so the exp, is going to get the value of that term. And so the value of that term, if it's a number, is going to literally be its, its face value. And remember it was being returned as a number. If it's a identifier, I'm going to return a, the, the actual value, which I look up with my function symbolval through $1. So I pass $1 to symbolval, which is the identifier, and it looks up the value in the simple table and assigns it. Now expressions also map to expressions with a plus term. So here's how I do my addition. And the semantics are, on that are the expression gets $1, which is exp, plus $3, which is the value of this term. Similarly, I have a rule exp minus term, and this one maps to $1 minus $3. So those are the simple rules in my language. And in the last section, I've got some helper functions that I need um, the implementation of the update symbol val as well as the symbol val. Both of these functions use this utility function that I wrote, compute symbol index. So if you give me a single alphabetical character, this function here is basically going to fi figure out which of the 52 elements in the symbol array that particular alphabetical character maps to. So we basically check. If it's lowercase, we compute the token, or the, the value of the index, as the value of the character minus the, the base, which is the lowercase, plus 26. And the uppercase ones, we just subtract the base. And so lowercase a through z are going to be 0 through 25. 
and the uppercase or the lower uppercase will be 0 through 25 and the lowercase are going to map from 26 to 51 and here's my function symbol val remember this is going to look up the value of the symbol and return it so in this case I can compute my symbol index which is the array the offset in my symbol table array for that particular variable and once I have computed it, I simply return the value of it. This function here, update symbol val, is going to do the same thing, compute the index, but then it's going to basically assign the val to that entry. And here's my main program. I'm going to initialize my symbol table to all zeros. So I'm going to make the assumption before I see any expressions that all my variables are initialized to zero. And then I'm simply going to call yyparse, which is the function generated by yak. So once I call yyparse, it's going to iteratively apply the grammar rules to the input until it either runs out of input or it actually finds a syntax error. So that is all I need. And I also define my yy error down there because the parser is going to uh, call that if it gets syntax errors. And we're simply going to print out the error in that case. But that is the yak file. And if we quickly take a look at the lex file that is called calc.l and we've seen these in a previous tutorial it's very simple um, I include my y.tab.h and this file is what's generated my def my pound defines for the different token types so each of those percent tokens uh, is defined inside here so if I see the the string print I'm going to return the token print if I see the term exit, I'm going to return the token exit command. So print and exit command here were both defined as percent tokens over in my yak file, and that generated code here is going to define those for me. Now here's where the union comes into play. This is my regular expression for representing my variable names, which are going to be a single character, a through z lowercase or a through z uppercase. So identifiers we're going to store in that ID element. So now we can say, instead of assigning something to yyvale, we can simply say yyvale.id. So it's yyvale now is a um, union type. And I'm going to take the very first character of the token, or yytext um, sub zero. And then the type that I'm going to return, so this, is, this first statement here is storing the value of the token. And then the second statement is returning the type. And remember, it's an identifier. When I recognize a digit, which is zero or more characters, or digits, or I'm sorry, one or more digits, now I'm going to assign that to yyvale.num, which was my integer value. And I'm going to store to that the textual value converted into an integer. And the type I return is a number. I ignore my white space and if I see a minus, a plus, a equal, or a semicolon, I simply return its face value. And you'll remember in the grammars we actually reference those as characters in single ticks. Anything else that I see, I'm going to print out an error message. And we also have in the third part the YY wrap, which we've talked about in the previous tutorial and we won't discuss further. So a very simple lex file that simply leverages the different symbols that I've defined inside the yak. So now we need to build this. So the first thing we want to do is run yak. So I'm going to say yak and I'm going to use the minus D option to get it to generate the y.tab.h. If you don't do this, you're going to have problems when you try to compile your final program. So the first step is to run yak on our yak input file. And this generates two files. It generates for us a y.tab.h, which is our header, and a y.tab.c, which is the actual generated parser. The next step, now that I have my y.tab.h, is to, is to run lex on my lex file 
And this is going to generate a lex.yy.c, which you can see right here. And now my last step is to compile both of these together. So I'm going to say gcc lex.yy.c and y.tab.c, and I'll put my output in calc. And now I have my executable interpreter. And if I type in error, it basically detects that. And so there you can see how we can use Lex and Yak to create a language processor without writing a great deal of code. And you can imagine with more sophisticated grammars, we can write some fairly interesting languages using this tool set.